thanks so much and it's nice to be here tonight. So much thanks to um, Jim who found me and invited me here. I'm really delighted to talk about Afon Moy. She's uh, someone who is very close to my heart. She's called the Chinese lady. And she was the first Chinese woman and really the first Chinese person in America who widely traveled and was known by many Americans um, from the early in the early 19th century. So tonight I'll particularly address her story and her visits in part to this area. Much of the talk, as Jim mentioned, is based on my book, The Chinese Lady, Ethel Moy in Early America, published by Oxford University Press. And this is also based somewhat on a long ago, as Jim mentioned, uh, George Washington University dissertation called The America China Trade Products for the Middle Class. And when I was doing that work, on my dissertation, I found mention of Afon Moy, and it really only served as one page in the dissertation. However, the thought of her just haunted me, and so I decided to make an effort to uncover the story of her life, and it only took 20 years. So I'll share with you tonight some of what I learned, uh, and there'll be time for questions at the end. So in the 1830s, um, Americans only really knew what a Chinese person looked like from images on imported ceramic ware, fans, wallpaper, fabrics. Afomoy was a sensation because now vast Americans uh, could really closely view an actual Chinese person, no less a Chinese woman. But because she was illiterate and she was unable to tell her own story, until recently we didn't know very much about her. Recordings about her really only occurred in diary and newspaper accounts, personal letters, ship manifests, some contemporary poems, period, and rare mentionings in period documents. And this is often the case with those who are voiceless. Yet we learn a lot when we unearth stories of people whose lives just previously were unrecorded and kind of buried in time. And so for me, it was not only an attempt to really understand Afon Moy and her story, but also to understand uh, and perceive how Americans at that time responded to her as the first Chinese person they'd ever met. So it was um, two perspectives, trying to understand how Afon Moy might perceive this world, but also how Americans perceived her. So some of you may know about Afomoy, but perhaps if you don't, you would wonder why Afomoy arrived in America in 1834, more than a decade before the Chinese came to California during the gold rush. Interestingly, her arrival relates to commerce. In the early 1830s, many middle-class Americans had money to kind of modestly spend on goods. Not, not just necessities, but on kind of fancy goods, things that would be um, a genteel way to express themselves in the home or uh, on their person. And at this point then, some very shrewd merchants saw the opportunity to provide these objects to the middle-class American people cheaply. Nathaniel and Francis Carnes, two cousins who originally came from Boston, one of them had been a factor or a uh, merchant's agent on a China trade ship, moved their firm to New York City. And in a really bold 
and innovative way, they captured an American middle class market by importing really relatively inexpensive domestic and fancy goods from China. And it's a long list, but it's an important list um, to get a sense of the breadth of the objects they imported. They included fans and handkerchiefs, children's toys, card cases, tea equipment, tea, fireworks, shawl, perfumes, combs, watercolors for people's walls, colored paper, snuff boxes, canes, matting, blinds, fly whisks, dusters, thread winders, and buttons. So these were not big objects. They were small, generally, and they were not expensive. The car and specials came into New York City beginning in the very early 1830s, loaded with all these small goods in their hold. And they sold them at affordable prices um, to the merchants. These goods were brought, as I said, in bulk. They were sold at auction to wholesale merchants. And then they were resold and distributed around the country to sort of local merchants here in Alexandria, for example, uh, and people then could um, have the opportunity to see them and buy them. A good number of these objects that I just mentioned, I came across when I was doing my dissertation here in, at George Washington, and I found them in an Alexandria home of the Stansfields, and I recorded them and photographed them. But I'll tell you more about that later in the talk. But then the question is, how did all this, these objects, relate to Afo Moy? I mean, what was the connection here with the commercial interest? So the Carnes were um, very, very astute. And they built on this very innovative and lucrative trade by engaging in a huge marketing ploy. On one of their vessels in October of 1834, they brought back a bound footed Chinese girl. The messaging and the advance notice about this girl sped up and down the East Coast via newspapers, starting before she came in early fall of 1834. And it built to a crescendo when she arrived on October 20th, 1834. And so I'm going to give you this sense of crescendo by giving you the Alexandria Gazette notices about Afong Moy in the fall of 1834. And I believe the first year of this particular publication in the city. So September 23rd, 1834, Alexandria Gazette, quote, for the ladies. Importation expected by ship Washington, the lady with a Chinese attendant with her, and received company in a parlor furnished a la Chanez. October 11th, 1834, Alexandria Gazette, quote, the Washington from Canton finally expected with a small footed Chinese female filial love for a valuable pecuniary consideration for her parent. Some suppose that if she lives two years, $30,000 will be realized by her keepers. That's $30,000 in 1834 money. That's a lot of money. October 20th, 1834, Alexandria Gazette, quote, arrive today from Canton. It didn't even need to say who had arrived. <laughs> Everybody knew by now because the crescendo was building. October 21st, 1834, Alexandria Gazette, quote, extraordinary arrival. With no ordinary emotions, we announced the safe arrival at port yesterday in the ship Washington, 
of the beautiful and accomplished, the long looked for and anxiously expected citizen of the celestial empire. Bold and daring genius of one of our hardy navigators to conceive and execute this yet untried and hazardous project." End quote. November 14th, 1834, Alexandre Gazette, quote, a visit to Afan Moy, the Chinese lady, there to pay our respects. And then the reporters go on, and I certainly would not bore you with the um, three paragraphs of explanation about the rich costume of her ladyship and all the other aspects of her presentation. Living in New York City in a large home near City Hall with Captain Benjamin O'Bear of the car and ship Washington and his wife Augusta, Afon Moy was presented in an elaborately contrived oriental parlor. And here you see her in a lithograph of this period in the captain's parlor. And here you see, remember I was giving you that list. Here you see some of the things that are around her that were sold. And so people are encouraged to come, encouraged to see her, have to pay a fee. Um, but encourage them to go to the auction and buy the things that they are going to see here. Through a young male Chinese interpreter by the name of A Tung, who holds an important place in the book, she presented, as I said, to the public for a fee, the goods from the car ship, as you see, surrounding her. The Chinese lady became a billboard for all things Chinese. And as you heard from the Alexandria Gazette, her, frame, her fame just spread nationwide. So the question is, who is Afon Moy? And how did the Carnes and the Auberts sort of spirit her out of China? Though we do know that some Chinese sailors were on American vessels as early as 1785, and some male Chinese servants did occasionally accompany their employers to America. They all had left illegally because Chinese law prohibited sailors and workers from leaving the country. However, there were ways and there were ways to circumvent these restrictions. Um, but as it was noted in the Gazette, it was hazardous. Bribery of custom officials took place often at the mouth of the Pearl River and boarding vessels kind of in an out of the way place and that allowed them to join foreign ships. But openly taking a young Chinese woman out of Canton, called Guangzhou, was something really entirely different. And this was, as the Gazette said, indeed daring, bold, and very precarious for the captain and the current merchants. If you angered the Chinese official, it would mean complete disbarment from future trading in the Chinese ports. So no one in China would allow a young, very young, unmarried Chinese girl to be unaccompanied no less leave the country in the presence of a foreign man. The Carnes and Benjamin O'Bear, the captain of the ship, they, they certainly knew this. And therefore, Car uh, Captain O'Bear's wife, Augusta, accompanied him to China. There is a later record of Augusta entering Guangzhou, which is in itself, a remarkable occurrence. And it's remarkable because no foreign woman was permitted to enter Chinese territory. Most of the women lived, if they were um, foreign women, they lived in Macau, which was a Portuguese island off the coast. 
and they lived there, but they did not enter into Guangzhou. This did occur several years before Augusta came. The Chinese, when they found out a woman, a foreign woman was in Guangzhou, they cut off all foreign trade until the women left Guangzhou. So it was completely verboten to have any uh, foreign woman in Guangzhou. Um, that this was permitted for Captain Aubert with his wife, Augusta, meant clearly that it had been prearranged and accepted by the Chinese ahead of time. So some arrangement had been made previously when Captain Aubert had come to Guangzhou because he had made three previous trips. So surely what was going on was that arrangement had been made prior to his arrival at this time in 1833. Because she had bound feet, befitting a girl slightly above a lower class status, Afon Moy, I have to surmise, was the daughter of a Chinese comprador, and a comprador was um, someone who is the go-between between the foreign merchants and the Chinese, or she was the daughter of a lesser Chinese merchant. But it is most likely she did not go willingly. She's young, it's terrifying. Certainly the Americans made it profitable for those who let her go. And you can tell from the Gazette that $30,000 figure that's a lot of money. Upon her arrival in the United States, Ethel Moy spent several months in New York City. However, the Chinese corn goods were being widely purchased in the wholesale trade, and it behooved them then to market these objects far and wide with Ethel Moy as part of the advertising campaign. So today, we think very little of this method of selling wares by personality. But this was amazingly, probably one of the very first efforts of its kind in America, using a personality to front the goods, to encourage people to buy. That was really innovative. In January 1835, she went with her handlers to Philadelphia. It was there for the first time that her bound feet were exposed, not to the public, but to local physicians. And this, of course, was meant to drum up publicity. Such exposure of bound feet was a total abrogation of what was proper in China totally wrong. The physicians testified publicly that her feet were indeed only four and three quarters inches. In New York City, Afamoy sat in an intimate parlor for eight hours a day, welcoming visitors for a fee. In Philadelphia, she received visitors at Washington Hall in an auditorium accommodating 6,000 people. Here you see an image of Afon Moy at the top on the cover of a catalog that I know was available in Philadelphia because a copy of this catalog was pasted into a diary owned by Samuel Breck, who was a Philadelphian, who went to see her at Washington Hall and explained the fact that she was there and then not giving a whole lot, much more, just pasted this in. So I'm gonna take a break for a minute uh, on Afamoy's story to give you a little background 
on the catalog you see. And though it looks very unprepossessing, the finding of this catalog, which had never before been seen, was an absolute eureka moment for me as a researcher. I knew of the existence of this catalog. I had read in a Portland, Maine newspaper notice on October 1st, 1834, that Chinese coins, which you can see listed here, uh, there's some Chinese coins listed um, here in the right here, noting that the coins uh, were made in the reign of the, uh, the Tang Dynasty. What happened was that the coins listed in the catalog were stolen from the salon where she was sitting. And somehow they later were returned, but I have no idea of the circumstances of the coins retrieval, but it was such a big deal that the, the, um, thief, the thief and, and the theft rather was noted in the newspaper. So for me, the 1834 retrieval of the catalog was equally serendipitous. I was researching in the New York Public Library, and one of the archivists who I'd gotten to know, and that's always a great thing when you get to know archivists who will support you and who will sort of guide you in a direction that will help you know where things are, mentioned that she had recently found an old typewritten list of documents and letters that had come to the library but hadn't yet been cataloged by the staff. And she was willing to share the list with me um, because the documents she knew were the time period that I've been working on. Many of the documents in this um, listing were from the papers of Samuel Tilden. He was <clears throat> excuse me, later governor of New York State, and he was a presidential candidate in 1876. But in 1834, Samuel Tilden was a very young 20 years old, and he was a student at New York University. And his papers um, carried this catalog. It's likely he attended Affelmoy's salon in New York and just tossed the catalog in with his other papers, thankfully. There is no record that I could find of his visit to Apple Moy Salon in New York at the time. So why am I making such a big deal about this catalog? Well, it's be very significant because this previously undiscovered document is the very first, albeit the smallest, published American catalog representing Chinese objects to the American public. As you can see here, the objects on the left side included that were listed there included a 600 year old Chinese mirror. A 1366 iron cup. A 1486 bell Chinese musical instruments and the infamous Chinese coins and currency. The catalog um, find is one of a dozen or more really exciting and often unexpected documents that researchers like me come across and uncover in research for books like this. Um, so exciting because there is so little information about Afomoy that when one finds a very um, salient document like this, it is so important. So back to Afomoy in Philadelphia. So we have to imagine this young girl's terror at confronting 6,000 people in Washington Hall. I mean, a 16 or 17 year old standing on a stage looking out at 6,000 people is pretty daunting, um, pretty amazing. But to give you a sense of the horror that she probably experienced, you know, at home in China, 
a young girl in a merchant's family never mingled with men, never was with a group of people. And it was completely improper and unheard of in China. Well, from Philadelphia, Afa Moy and her entourage then traveled further south with the destination of Washington, DC. And the reason why they were moving to Washington, DC and not stopping along the way was because they wanted to rapidly get to the Capitol before the 23rd Congress recessed on March 4th, 1835. Because all of you know that it's a little bit quieter in Washington, DC after the congressmen and the senators and everybody else has left for the session. So they wanted to ensure that they would have an audience of these congressmen and senators and the president. Here in Washington, DC, the Daily National Intelligencer took over the reporting. As noted in the Intelligencer, she sat for viewing at the Washington Athenaeum. And I'm going to take this off because um, I don't need to keep looking at that. Um, she sat for viewing at the Washington Athenaeum, uh, the site they averred in capital letters in the intelligencer was a splendid Chinese salon. And the choice of the venue, interestingly, indicated the manager's attempt to kind of position her not as um, not really as a sales event or a theatrical event, but as an educational event. The advertisement for her viewing noted that visitors could expect to see objects from China, which you heard about, Chinese costume, Chinese language and writing, and of course, a discussion of foot binding. And in so doing, clearly the managers provided her that opportunity for admittance to the most esteemed address, the president's house. Reporters uh, in the intelligencer uh, contended that, quote, the expectations of the lady, Afon Moy, had been raised to a very high pitch as to the magnificent, magnificence of the fonti or emperor, as she termed the president, end quote. But finding Andrew Jackson's abode and attire less than magnificent, she reported to translators or to reporters through a translated message that, quote, his kind and courteous manner appeared amply to compensate for the deficiency of outward grandeur. She had clearly expected something pretty wonderful and the president's house was not quite what she'd expected. Little of their conversation found its way into the press, but what surfaced through the translated accounts with Jackson's comment saying that, quote, she should persuade her countrywomen to abandon the custom of cramping their feet, end quote. So understanding Jackson's perspective on this indicated that Jackson saw her as some kind of an envoy from China with power to affect change and an ability to go back to China on her own terms. And of course, nothing of that was true. So we're now in the sixth month of her stay in America, and Afon Moy was back on the road. And this time, in, instead of going um, south, she went north. She went north to Baltimore, taking the nine hour trip from DC to Baltimore by stagecoach. She arrived in Baltimore on March 13th. There she presented at the Peel Museum on Calvert Street. Some of you may have heard of the Peel Museum in Baltimore. It's no longer there, but um, it was had been up until fairly recently an important museum in Baltimore. Here, most fortunately, we have pretty good record 
of her visit by several who commented on her. One, John Gordon, who is a fairly young banker, recorded in his diary that he was not much pleased as we didn't see her foot, the only thing worth seeing, end quote. But 17-year-old Margaret Gibson, in a letter to her brother in New York, who had seen Afong Moy there, had a much more appreciative view of her feet. Margaret said in her letter to her brother, quote, we all visited the Chinese lady and were really delighted. I have heard so much of her feet being disgusting. It's, that sounds like a teen. Um, that when I did see her, I was much surprised. Could I divest myself of being contrary to nature? I should think them beautiful. And she underlines this. She placed them very prettily on the ground. And although she totters and seems pained by walking, I cannot think the appearance disgusting." End quote. And then she went on at some length. And here it's really instructive for me to provide this for you because it gives you a view, an insightful view that the newspapers don't. This young girl, 17 year old, who is about the same age as Afong Moy, very perceptively observed that the Chinese women pictured in the watercolors on the wall, all those watercolors, remember I mentioned that are up there because they're gonna be sold, looked quite different from Afong Moy. They had delicate skin and they wore clothing with much, quote, much more taste. This led Gibson to speculate that Afong Moy was, quote, of low birth, for I do not think any real lady would have visited us, and that may account for her being so ugly. Like, and her complexion is dark, end quote. She remarked that Afong Moy's hands were red, and they looked as though they needed soap and water. And unlike many other personal commentators I've found, she evidenced also a degree of compassion. She said, quote, poor thing. She is much to be pitied. She seemed very timid and confused, end quote. And I, it's much more to the letter. And of course, this is one of those wonderful, um, important documents that you find that you just are so excited about getting hold of. For the next several years, Afomoy traveled the country and abroad with her manager, Henry Hanninger, and his wife, Catherine, from Baltimore to Charleston, back to New York, into New England, Boston, Salem, Providence, New Haven, Hartford, Worcester, and then across to Albany. And on November 19th and 1835, the Alexandria Gazette pops up again and reported on her time in Albany, stating that she sang Chinese songs to her visitors. Returning then to New York City, she then left by ship for Havana, Cuba. Documenting her short time there was really fascinating. Cubans perceived her very differently from Americans. They really treated her with a great deal of respect and consideration. Once back from Havana, she then traveled to Pensacola, moved on to Mobile, Alabama, then by boat to New Orleans, up the Mississippi River. She visited Natchez and all the individual little towns all along the way up the Mississippi and Ohio rivers. And you have to imagine what this travel was like for a young woman, unable to speak the language, unfamiliar still with the food and the customs, and probably pretty challenged to travel on bound feet. And we have to remember they're not roads, of course, like they are today. These were ruts and often they got stuck and it meant you had to get out of the stagecoach 
and walk along next to it. And then when it was out of the rut, you had to get back in. And this is what she would have had to deal with on found feet. The exciting portion of the research was to investigate each site, note what transpired, record what visitors said of her and of China in their personal accounts, find poems written about her by people she met along the way, and document her presence in all the town's newspapers, and then to determine what objects were promoted in these places. I mentioned briefly at the beginning that for my work on the dissertation, I spent time reviewing Chinese-made objects in the collection of the Alexandria family, the Stansfields. And possibly, I, I, maybe some of you know the Stanfields. I had access to them because Bill Seal, who a, was a wonderful historian, was one of my dissertation advisors. And he was acquainted with the family who owned these objects. What I found in their Alexandria home were the same sorts of objects that the Carnes and their merchants sold to the American public and Afon Moy hawked. Their collection included Chinese children's toys, a wonderfully small um, Chinese automaton, automaton man, a ring puzzle, an ivory tangram puzzle, and several Chinese fans of feather and paper and silk, varieties of women's tortoiseshell hair combs, ivory dressing combs, card cases, glass beaded lanterns, lacquer tea caddy, camper wood trunks, and folding writing desks. Of course, I can't tell you with complete certainty that these goods came off the Carnes ships, but they were of the exact same nature. So they likely could have been. And back to Afon Moy. Now at the end of this three year journey, her manager Harrington and his wife, Catherine, returned to their hometown of New York, but they returned to some very unpleasant realities. First, the depression of 1837, a truly horrible time economically in America. And then while they had been away, a massive New York City fire destroyed the Carnes merchants warehouses with nearly all the unsold inexpensive Chinese goods that had been stored there. Their particular warehouses were right in the middle of the fire. They lost everything. So the reason for Afomoy's presence in America, right, was to hawk these goods, but there were not many goods left to hawk. It was no longer a viable opportunity for her. No one came to her aid. Not the Carnes merchants who instigated the initial trip, nor the ship captain or his wife, Augusta, nor the manager and his wife, Catherine. She was unceremoniously dropped with no place to go, no money and no help. And she ended up in a New Jersey poorhouse for eight years. But interestingly enough, during this time, New Jersey citizens near the poorhouse in Monmouth, New Jersey, noticed this woman in the poorhouse. She doesn't look like the other people in the poorhouse. And they reported on what they saw to a local newspaper. To their great credit, and also to the local newspaper people, they made their font of Afo Moy a national news story. They promoted it as a national campaign to find and determine who was to blame, who put her there, who made her stay in this place. Newspapers throughout the country ran the article, as did the Alexandria Gazette in 1838. The article noted that Afomoy deserved, quote, the special attention of the humane and benevolent of our community, end quote. So the barrage of criticism in the newspaper escalated, really, with several people implicated. And it went back and forth. It was fascinating reading. Um, and it went all across the United States. Finally, without names mentioned in the newspaper, very, very sad news for a researcher. The implicated persons indicated they would contribute monies to the poorhouse for her benefit. And even though they didn't note it in the newspaper, I was able to find who the culprits were. So you can find that out in the book. 
There's much more to Athelmoy's story. It didn't end there. In July 1847, a Chinese junk, the king, left Hong Kong for London with a Chinese crew, captained by a Caucasian, but they had a little problem. Um, they thought they were going to London, but they ended up in New York City. Uh, there was a little difficulty with the um, traveling, and the captain, who was a Caucasian, really didn't know how to maneuver a Chinese junk. So visitors in New York were charged an exhibition fee to climb aboard the junk in New York City to see the vessel. It was a huge sensation all over the newspapers. And along with the junk, Afo Moy reappeared. And the Alexandria Gazette reported it. August 13th, 1847. Quote, the Chinese lady who is exhibiting herself in New York is the Afo Moy who traveled the country some years ago, end quote. The book recounts in great detail, which I won't go into, how she reappeared in eight years. The person who instigated her revival was the renowned showman Phineas Taylor P.T. Barnum. In August 1847, he presented Afwell Moy at Niblos, a theater on Broadway, and the Junk King's presence provided a large, large quantity of material for him, publicity material for Barnum to work with, as you might imagine. In early 1848, Afomoy appeared for the first time with Charles Stratton, AKA General Tom Thumb, as part of Barnum's presentations at his American Museum in New York City. Their act drew huge crowds. Quote, the two astonishing natural curiosities, said the New York Herald, one nearing 30 years old, and the other merely 10. It must have been a sight. So one might imagine Tom Thumb kind of coyly copying Afon Moy taking a meal with chopsticks uh, with a disastrous result. During um, this time together, Barnum published a seven page pamphlet promoting both of them, which I was able to find. And in the pamphlet, Afon Moy was a really extensive write up. And Barnum's two attractions presented nearly uh, together nearly two years. In later 1849, she was promoted as Afong Moy Nan Choi. And this is the name. In the November 13th, 1849 Alexandria Gazette that was used to promote her visit without Tom Thumb to the Lyceum commencing on that day. It is the first time I've located Afong Moy in Alexandria, possibly, as Jim and I were saying, there wasn't an appropriate site since the Lyceum wasn't built until 1839. And by then, Afomoy was in the poorhouse. The announcement in the Alexandria partially reads, quote, rare exhibition, the Chinese lady, Afomoy Noin Choi, the only celestial that ever left the walls of China will appear in her native Chinese costume of superb embroidery at the Lyceum Hall for a few nights commencing November 13th, 173 years ago, almost to the day. So almost to the day, 173 years ago. She quote, will sing Chinese songs, show the manner of eating with chopsticks. She will display her wonderful little feet and her magnificent worshiping and imperial robes. Open at seven, Exhibition begins at 7.30, tickets 25 cents, children and guardians, half price. I'd hope the Alexandria Stansfield family would have seen her, commented on it, but I found no record of that. Perhaps some of you will find a trunk of letters in, or diaries in your attic, and you will find something that will have described her uh, time in Alexandria. By the end of 1850, Afomoy's name had almost entirely disappeared from the newspapers. Barnum purposefully eliminated Afomoy from publicity. According to Barnum, the master promoter, a new Chinese lady had arrived in New York City from Guangzhou on the vessel Iante. The new Chinese lady was 17 years old. Pan Yanqi said to have come with her family from China and billed as, quote, the only Chinese lady out of China, a genuine lady, and no mistake, end quote. And this was Barnum's typical technique of supplanting one performer, bringing in a competing act. 
He tried it with General Tom Thumb by bringing in another called Major Littlefinger, but the public did not like that. And they reminded Barnum, Barnum that there was only one Tom Thumb. Do not try that on us. But unfortunately, Afon Moy did not have the same devoted followers. And um, unfortunately, no one questioned or contested the veracity of her replacement. Since Barnum did this more than once, he must have found it was a good thing to do. The only problem was that in doing research, I found no Chinese family on the Ayante ship passenger list. And visitors at the time overheard the Chinese lady speaking in a low Yankee slang. <laughs> Probably Barnum had knit together a Chinese family from the Chinese Americans now living in New York City and quite possibly none of them had ever set foot in China or on the vessel Iante. Afong Moy surfaced, resurfaced once in 1851 to inaugurate a railroad in Ohio, and that was the last time she presented in public. I wish that I could conform, confirm how Afong Moy made her way in this last period of her life. I spent an enormous amount of time trying to determine her fate, but ultimately, she just disappeared into the American landscape, quite possibly without family or any means of support. And such is often the erasure of many of the voiceless. I'm hopeful that people who might read the book might have any information or clue that would complete the story. Well, as you heard, the story is focused on Afo Moy and her experience. Um, but the part that I think is also interesting, how Americans perceived and responded to her as the first Chinese person they'd ever met, um, I don't go into, but you can find that in the book. So I'm happy to take questions um, and anything that wasn't clear, I could make clearer. Tom Thumb also appeared here at the Lyceum at one time, not with Afong Moy. Aha, uh -huh. that is great to know. Yes. Um, you talk about the Chinese goods in the 1830s. When are the first Chinese goods coming to America? Where are Americans first uh, have a chance to purchase and consider imports from China? How early is that? Very early. These that I'm talking about are goods that are intended for a middle class, but the Chinese goods that came um, for the upper middle class came early. And we know, you know, if we go to Mount Vernon, you can see um, George Washington's Chinese uh, ceramics. Um, and so that's something that is brought in and certainly wallpaper, expensive wallpaper, really wonderfully crafted Chinese furniture. But this is all expensive silk um, cloth, but all quite expensive, but very early on, um, you know, before the American Revolution. So it's just that this period in the in 1830 is when it explodes because it's cheap. Does that answer what you? Was there, did you find anything about like retaliation from the Chinese like or against this company? Like were they ever allowed back? Did they? Did the Chinese find out that they had spirited someone out of the country or? Well, as I was saying, the interesting thing is they did know. I, I went to um, I went to China. Uh, to do a little bit more research if I could find something. It was clear that in this time period when Afamoy um, was being taken, that there was a huge flood in Guangzhou and in this area around the Pearl River. It was disastrous. And what happened uh, at this time was that um, the rice fields had been um, decimated. There was very little food and people were selling their children in the street and um, 
and merchants, foreign merchants were so concerned, they began to supply food to those in Guangzhou. So it was a very difficult time. This specific time period was difficult. And my sense is, yes, they knew. And the Carnes vessels, there were a number of them that kept coming after the Washington. So altogether, probably um, six or seven more, maybe eight more um, trips with goods coming uh, continually after Afonmoy came. So they weren't penalized uh, because it had been, quote, sanctioned in some way. Um, so I have a question. I'm, I'm trying to think about the years and the history and everything. And I'm thinking about uh, the gold rush and Chinamen coming and then them being illegal with the Chinese Exclusion Act. And I know that I'm just having a hard time figuring out that juxtaposition between the elegant Chinese lady and then the depictions in the newspapers of Chinese men as rats with the long tails. And, and then second of all, I love the way that you kind of put us through the perspective of this young woman and how she went up the Mississippi River during the time of the slave trade. Natchez was like a huge, like probably the number one slave trading port. And I just would, just can't imagine what she must have thought going through all of that. Well, you're very right. Um, I, I'll answer the last part of your question first. Um, I thought it was fascinating. When, if you read the book, you'll see that I spend a lot of time on this. Um, filling out all the experience around Afon Loy, because um, not only was she experiencing and seeing in Charleston um, slave trading going on, she certainly saw that uh, the advertisements, and I don't know that she could read them, but they were certainly terrifying, I would think, if she could read even a little bit of it. The other thing that I propose is that she actually may have been on a vessel that was doing Indian removal. And so she was not only seeing, this was a high time for Indian removal. So she was seeing this in New Orleans. They were moving them from Alabama to New Orleans and moving Native Americans and then moving them up and out. And so she was on a vessel that um, had um, Native Americans on it to be moved there were a lot of experiences where she was viewing what was really challenging in um, the American experience at this point. And then your first question was the issue of how did this um, drastic change occur in the way in which Americans viewed the Chinese? What was fascinating to me, and, and I do try to bring this out in the book is that when she was in the poorhouse for eight years and came back out there was a very different attitude about the chinese just in that period of eight years and what happened was that um, we saw that there at this point the Foreigners were able to go into China. They began to see what was going on in China. Um, they were no longer giving the Chinese that kind of grace and no longer saw them uh, as uh, elegant or, um, or, or history laden and wonderful. They began to make fun of them and they began to um, deride them and she began you can see this in all the ways that people were beginning to really mock her um, as she came out again in the later part of her experience and you know with barnum so um it really was um this experience of foreigners penetrating into china seeing it differently and then bringing that back and responding. 
in an interesting way. So it changed. Americans' view changed during this period quite rapidly, and then um, a very different experience with, of course, um, the experience in California. We have a question from Zoom. Mm -hmm. I should be wearing my glasses. Um, you mentioned poems written about her. Were these published in newspapers, and were there other um, popular culture items associated with her? So many 19th century sensations had such. For example, were there any musical pieces written about her? Um, now, you may know of any musical pieces, but I don't know of any musical pieces. Mm. There was a horse named after her. Oh. So she, a racing horse, a race horse was named after her. And there were um, two um, fairly widely, two or three fairly widely published poems about her. One was um, by a Philadelphian and had he had been to China. And interestingly enough, he really understood what it might be like to come from China to America and experience this disjuncture of life. Um, and then there was another poem that was pretty widely published about her. Um, and that was out of Cincinnati, Ohio person who saw her in Cincinnati, Ohio, and wrote a poem about her, and it was published as well. So these weren't just poems that I found in diaries. They were poems that were there for the American public to read. Is that, I, th I hope that answers. Yeah. Yes, I think that answers their question. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. You're welcome.